And finally, I already built on that when I was referring to selling insurance. You have a chance of tailoring not only your products, but also how you sell them, your message. And I'll give you an example of how people differ in terms of language they use. What you see here are the language that is received and emitted by different genders. And you can see how, how excited and so excited women are uh, and how men talk about politics, government, economy, taxes, and so on. If you will try to use these orange messages to address blue people, you simply missed it. They will, just, they will just skim over it. They will not read it, right? Of course, at the moment, you probably just have one very nicely crafted message that you kind of send in the whole market. But why would you do it? If you can actually distinguish between men and women, between liberal and conservative, between introvert and extrovert, use this as a chance to find craft a message that will kind of best uh, match the patterns in which they think. And it's not only about gender. What you can see here, you can see here some psychological traits. Gregarious and warm and extroverted there. Uh, and you can see people uh, like saying cute and adorable puppy and babe and so on. Whereas people who are cold-hearted, they talk about money and bank and accounts and student loans and so on. Happy people. I'll just go quickly now through it. Uh, to leave you sometimes for questions. Happy people, for some reasons they like swimming. Give me a psychologist that will explain that. I have no idea. Well organized people. Family, great day, ready, vacation. Extroverted people. Oh no, those are introverts, sorry, negative extroversion. Introverts, internet, computer geeks. You kind of get the picture, right? Like, I guess if you know any, someone introverted, he'll be using this language a lot. And now extroverted guys, party, love, girls, weekends, and so on. Agreeable, so people who are very kind of focused on maintaining social relationships. So, but of course, there are also risks involved in targeting on individual level. And there are a few areas here. Uh, so first of all, you can actually find people, and increasingly people with, will withdraw from digital environment. They'll say, okay, Facebook is creepy, Google is creepy, they kind of want to learn too much about me, so maybe I should kind of stop using this, those technologies. And guys, the responsibility for bringing those guys back and making sure that they actually start trusting digital technology again is in your hands. I'm sorry to say, but it's marketing's fault, and I can give you some few good examples that people got scared of what's going on online. You probably heard about Target in the United States predicting pregnancies and then sending a well-targeted advert just that sometimes before even the woman knew, realized that she's pregnant, Target already knew. Hey guys, you know, I understand the advantage here, but it's just best way to kind of alienate your consumers as well. Fake footprints. When people would realize What's going on? Some people withdraw. Other people may try to create fake footprints, just mess up the Facebook profile. And actually, here I just want to mention that I think this is not really such a serious, serious problem as people believe in. It's simply, it's simply inconceivable that you will spend half of your day on Facebook clicking random things just to kind of mess up your tracks. It's just not possible. Now, your behavior, if, and if you can keep messing up your track and looking like an introvert for five last five years, you just, I'm sorry to say, you're probably just an introvert. <laughs> Legal issues. The European Union, actually according to European, I've, I've been recently at the, at, the, at, the, at the conference here uh, in London related to privacy issues online, and there was a lawyer who is responsible in European Union for, uh, for privacy concerns. And he said, according to EU law, internet is illegal in Europe. And of course, you realize that no one is shutting down it yet, uh, though a privacy officer from Google has a, a sentence or two in Europe and cannot travel to uh, this beautiful place on Earth because you'll be immediately put to prison. But there is a battle going on there, and the huge changes, uh, uh, the huge changes will take place. So you kind of, when, you, when you build technology for the future, you have to keep in mind that what's possible now 
might not be possible uh, in a few years or even a few months. And of course, creepy targeting. Just try not to be creepy. And I think that actually being open with a consumer and saying, hey, this is what we know about you. Hey, would you like us actually to run a prediction? Moreover, what you, another trick that we psychologists use is to try to share the results with a consumer first before you see them. So you can, what you can offer, this could be really simple. When they come to your website, before you make a recommendation, you say, hey, this is what we know about you. You can correct it, you can change it, but you can also completely remove it. And only if you're completely happy with it, press OK, we'll use it to target. Such a little change, you actually give them a chance to contribute to your prediction because they can kind of improve your understanding of themselves and kind of you make sure they're not creeped out because they kind of know what's going on and they have always an option to opt out. Uh, so thank you guys for your attention and I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you very much. I'll hand over to uh, compare some questions to Headley from Summit. Great, thank you. Michal, um, I'm a bit worried now, given that we had, uh, we had supper last night and we met each other for a couple of hours, you probably know what I'm going to ask you. Well, it, well yeah, I'm, I'm not going to mention, well, I'm, I'm, I know what you want to ask me, but you will not do it here. <laughs> we'll see. Um, <laughs> so it was interesting, I came down um, slightly from coffee and, and um, uh, I said to Michal, we've chosen a winner for um, the 20-minute the uh, business idea. And he said, oh, which one? And I said, well, it was the uh, clean up your social profile. And um, I'll let you tell, tell you what he said, but he felt that we'd picked the wrong one. Now, why was that? Well, to be honest, I work a lot with HR teams and HR directors, so kind of marketing and HR kind of my two natural praying grounds. And a uh, year or two ago, HR people would tell you, you know, we are scanning those Facebook profiles and would never invite for the interview anyone who has some drunken pictures and so on. But actually, this year I've been to Sweden. Maybe Sweden is just more liberal and more open-minded. But I've met with uh, some HR people from top companies, including Volvo, for instance. And actually, we had this discussion in a, in a room like that. And the general consensus was that, of course, they keep scanning Facebook profiles. But what they said, if we cannot find a drunken picture of, a, of our candidate, we are very suspicious. You know? <laughs> they said, either he has no friends, who would take the drunken picture of himself, or he's not going out, or he's so good at lying and managing his kind of public appearances that we should really kind of dig through his CV and kind of check everything is all right. So remove the most extreme pictures from Facebook and from the digital world, but just leave some pictures that represent you as a human being. I think it's a, it's a good uh, first interview advice. I think they'll have spent the iTunes vouchers by now. Um, okay, I mean, that's absolutely fascinating. At, at Summit, we've had a vision for years that we are um, all, almost like uh, marketeers are really like criminal psychologists, and I have this picture of cre scene of crime on the wall with these digital fingerprints or footprints, and our job is to join them up and create a picture. And this is one of the, the, the most first and r really meaningful ways that I've seen uh, that's so much further advanced than looking at Google Analytics and other... Meaning, meaningful data which is full of inaccuracy. So um, you must have some questions for Michal. Who wants to go first? Hi. Um, one question, just how did you source the 60,000 Facebook profiles? Well, so actually this was a subsample of a sample of 8 million profiles that we uh, used to develop our models in the first place. And we simply offered people feedback on their personality. So what we did, we put some personality questions on Facebook. We didn't offer them any money. We actually asked some of them for money just to check how it works. And, uh, and we find out that people really like to learn more about themselves. And we also never forced them to give us any data, but we said, hey, if you like the, if you like the research, if you like the, the, the feedback that we gave you, could you please press here to kind of share your Facebook uh, data with us? And more than 8 million people actually decided to give us full access to the Facebook accounts, which we later used to uh, develop this tool and other tools as well that I was presenting here today. Great, thank you. Who else has a question? Thanks very much, very interesting. Um, is it your contention that character traits are constant or have any of your analyses identified changes in you know, personas, in where people live, devices, are they at work, are they at home, that kind of thing? 
Yes, so kind of, it's a, it's a very good, um, uh, it's a very good quest question, thanks for that. So what I was showing here were kind of pretty, um, pretty permanent traits, like your gender doesn't really change so often. Uh, though there was a study actually in the department next to ours and they had to cancel the study because 7% of participants changed the gender in the meantime <laughs> and it just didn't work anymore. But this was a very specific population. That's probably not a typical Argos customer. <laughs> Uh, so when you look at Facebook likes or websites visited and you look at the long history, then of course it helps you to uh, kind of build a profile of permanent traits like personality, which is permanent, happiness, which actually is also quite permanent. You have some spikes here in their mood, but uh, the level, uh, the kind of average level is pretty stable. But especially if you, when you analyze language and you can also feed the same model with the pieces of language like Facebook status, updates, tweets, essays, emails, or even transcribed or automatically transcribed by a mobile pieces of conversation, you can turn this into emotional state uh, at the given moment. And we actually have some uh, good scientific publications on that as well. And of course, I just wanted to add, well, I'm talking about scientific publications and so on, but those systems are really being used in real life at the moment. Uh, we, uh, we have up to one million calls to personality API a week. Uh, which means that up to one million people are being profiled a week. Some of it we do ourselves. Some of it is done by other companies. It's an open, free system. Anyone can use it without really any registration. Uh, well, there's a registration, but you don't really have to give us your name and so on. Uh, so we don't really know even who is using it. We know that Facebook is using it uh, to some extent. I'm not sure if any, in any products, but they're definitely testing it. I know that some big dating websites are using it to uh, match people using the personality profile. So there's already kind of a lot going on uh, in the real world. So just to be clear, um, anybody can upload some data about their, their customers to you. You will then profile them and send back a almost a psychometric profile of each customer based on your model. Yeah, in a fraction of a second. In a fraction of a second. And then it's up to the company to, to decide what to do with that profile and how to use it in their marketing or whatever they present to that customer. Yes. Okay. It's, to be honest, to be honest, I see because, of course, as a as university person, I see a bit of an ethical issue here. But because this technology is available and uh, it wouldn't take much for a big company to develop the exactly same system, I think that the pressure should be put on getting a consent from the user. And actually we're in touch with, let's say, European Commission and we say, look, this technology is available. We just made it open. Anyone can use it. Make sure that policies are shaped in such a way that companies will use this technology in an ethical way. Because us shutting this down or not would not change the fact that these days Forget about personality. These days you can actually figure out what's your religion or what is your sexual orientation uh, simply based on your Spotify uh, uh, listen to list. <laughs> Very accurately, actually. <laughs> um, does anybody have any more questions for Michael? So based on, I've got a question for you, based on what you've seen as retailers in the room, um, is this uh, something that you feel you would use? Kind of a show of hands, a bit of a straw poll. Okay, great. So you'll be uh, logging into the API this afternoon. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you, Michal.